Hi everybody. So I wanted to take a little bit of time today and go through some background information on reflection. This is a presentation that I did at uh, the American Educational Research Association conference um, a year ago in Vancouver and it describes this heuristic that I developed that looks at reflection in two different ways one in terms of the orientations that we hold for the purposes and practices of reflection and then the different components of reflection that we might engage in within any particular program or process. So again it's some background on our approach as reflective practitioners. So basically I'll spend some time discussing the problem as I see it uh, the first dimension, orientations to reflection. The second dimension, components of reflection. Now, when I originally designed the heuristic, it was specifically applicable to reflective activities within teacher education programs. But I think it has some relevance for our purposes, too, uh, in terms of our own development as practicing teachers um, with respect to reflection. And then I will take a minute and, and describe the heuristic that I developed that you've all seen before in the article I wrote, but we'll go into it a little bit more detail here. I'll describe some current research that I'm involved in and then something about the significance of the heuristic. So the problem really is that reflection is a very popular construct in professional teaching practice but it's not very well defined or operationalized. Everybody agrees that it needs to be a part of, of what we do both in teacher education and in the professional practice of teaching. But it's defined, as it says, defined, implemented, and measured in lots of different ways. And as we see increasing accountability pressures on both practicing teachers and teacher education programs, the role of reflection uh, may take a different uh, a different direction. Uh, these people recently wrote that there's really little public evidence that it's actually going on in an explicit way, particularly in teacher education programs. So that's one reason that uh, I am taking a very explicit uh, approach to involving you in the practice of reflection in this course. So this idea of orientations to reflection really is a way of thinking about the complexity of, of uh, reflective activity. Uh, what am I doing with it? Um, how, how meaningful is it? And it comes originally from um, some scholarship from Max Van Manen, the phenomenological researcher, uh, back in the late 70s who basically said the kind of uh, reflective reflection uh, is somewhat consistent with the different approaches that we take to research in the social sciences. If you think about uh, the kind of research that goes on, there's really three kind of uh, camps that it falls into. There are those people that feel that we need to do rigid scientific designs making use of what we know about human behavior uh, where we have treatment and control groups and we have random assignment uh, as if we were doing a traditional scientific experiment where we are collecting quantitative data and then analyzing it using qu quantitative tools. So that's one uh, level of both research and reflection. The second level, which Van Manen calls the practical level of reflection, is tied to the phenomenological and qualitative and naturalistic research practices that started becoming more popular in the 70s and 80s, where we took much more um, deep looks at the context of various uh, phenomena that we were studying and where we got into uh, learning about the lived experiences of the people involved um, and 
really started using tools such as interviews, deep observation, um, participant observation, where, actu where we're actually a part of it. So we're removing the traditional objectivity of the researcher and instead we're becoming a part of what's going on and seeking to describe and understand what's going on in this particular uh, setting and context with the hope that maybe we'll learn something from that that might be applicable to our context too. But without the idea that what we're coming up with is a generalizable truth with a capital T that can then be applied to everybody. And the third lens that we use to look at reflection is the critical lens and that grew out of the critical pedagogy, the critical neo-Marxist research that uh, kind of goes back to people like Paulo Freire. We'll do some reading on that. If you take the critical pedagogy course, you'll learn a lot more about that. Uh, but looked at really how we, we do research um, to improve the situation of the disadvantaged in society. Our, our, whole, our whole purpose in education, in research, and in reflection is to uh, make things better, to reshape society. So uh, that was the way Van Manen first started to describe different types, categories, or levels of reflection. And some of the, what he said is, is really very powerful in that he said that these exist as paradigms in which you can't be in more than one at the same time. They're kind of incompatible with each other. So that was really the first time we started to see categorization or classification of reflection and reflective thought into these different, into these different levels. Now Donald Schoen um, is widely credited with the popularization of the term the reflective practitioner from his book that he wrote in 1983. And he really looked at reflection in a different way. He looked at reflection as the development of artistry, of those, this, this body of professional knowledge that, that really talented practitioners bring to bear in what they do on any given day with any given problem. And he kind of characterized this into two different categories, what he calls reflection in action, which is kind of that spontaneous use of, of your talent and your professional knowledge. He called it building and accessing your repertoire. And so typically when you see really skilled practitioners doing something, uh, you can see that they are engaged in an ongoing, continuous process of, of collecting data, reflecting upon it, making decisions, almost split second, contemporaneous kind of decision making based on this. And this development of this ability to conduct reflection in action uh, was an important part of Schoen's idea. The reflection on action is a little more traditional. That's kind of the retrospective approach, looking back towards what happened and, and what went on and analyzing and making meaning of that. And he provided several different, uh, different methods or different processes for doing that. Oftentimes these were very much not solitary, but they were communal or they were uh, dialogical in which you might be working with a coach or conferring with someone else. He has three kind of different practices that he goes into. One of them is called the, the follow me approach, uh, which is kind of you work with a, a professional practitioner uh, who has a lot of expertise and you basically follow them along and, uh, uh, and consider their decision making as they go through that. So Linda Valley in 1997 kind of pulled all these things, these different uh, approaches together in, a, in an article that I found pretty seminal. And I drew a lot uh, from her article in terms of thinking about these different, these five different orientations to reflection. Really you want to think about an orientation as defining for you what is valuable, what is valued about reflection, what is true about reflection, 
and what is real about reflection. So this graphic, <clears throat> in some sense, uh, that I created represents the five different approaches to reflection. And this is somewhat consistent with Van Manen's ideas in that um, they do go from simpler to more complex in terms of uh, the approaches that are involved, in terms of the kinds of questions you ask about them. And later on when we get into the components aspects of reflection, we'll see how uh, there's the, the components really are a manifestation of the orientation. So we start with a simple view of technical reflection as it says this is basically looking at am I following somebody else's definition of best practices. Uh, efficient te teaching techniques derived from research. So if somebody else comes in uh, and tells you what to do uh, that's pretty much a technical approach to it, if that's why you are reflecting. Um, if you've been involved in some of these workshops that are called What Works, that is a technical approach to your teaching practice and your reflection upon how well did I do is going to be a technical kind of reflection. Reflection in and on action is, uh, in some sense, it's a little harder to get a hold of what that means but as it says, it's really reflection that looks at the construction of practical knowledge, knowledge that you can use in your practice, uh, gained from your own experience, and also for the purpose of developing what we call this, this repertoire of practice. Deliberative reflection is one that seems to come pretty naturally to a lot of people in teaching because it really looks at uh, consideration of your decision making and looking at multiple perspectives, multiple sources of information to make those decisions. Rather than if we would compare that to technical. Technical is I'm going to consider somebody else's standards or definitions to make my decisions. Deliberative is considering many different kinds of things. Um, when we start talking about curriculum, I'll tell you that all of those things like standards, textbooks, national standards, state standards, um, curriculum guides, pacing guides, frameworks, all of those things are influences on your curricular decision making. And that idea that all these different things are influences is very much a deliberative perspective. Personalistic reflection, as I mentioned the other day, this is somewhat of, a, of a, a, an introspective approach. It really focuses on the development of yourself as a person versus am I becoming an efficient and effective teacher? Instead, it's what kind of a person am I becoming? And so, uh, as it says, it's much less a professional kind of thing, it's much more of a personal kind of thing, almost uh, a, uh, uh, a little bit of an Eastern philosophy built into it. Critical reflection is, as I've said before, it takes uh, the idea of critical theory, um, is, our, is our approach, is everything we do aimed towards um, removal of those, those structures in society that continue to um, disadvantage uh, those that are not in the dominant group. That's a reflective approach. <clears throat> so this orientation dimension, some people have said that it's hierarchical. You start at the bottom. You start with technical and you move your way up to critical. And the goal is to get to critical. Um, I don't necessarily think that. I think that, uh, that certain types are prerequisite to others. <coughs> Excuse me. In that they are simpler, less complex. Um, and I also would suggest that there are certain kinds of skills and abilities that you would acquire within, any, within a particular dimension that you would need to apply to a more complex dimension such as um, the understanding of the consistency between your 
uh, your teaching, your instructional decisions in a teaching episode at the technical level. How consistent were they with the standard? Uh, what kind of, of things do I think about to determine if they're consistent? And then applying that at the deliberative level to be able to say, okay, so um, I know how to match up my instructional decision making to this standard. Now, how does it map onto some different concern that I might have? So each one of these um, has problems with it. Um, for example, the um, um, reflection in and on action, Donald Schoen's approach, um, is a little bit, um, um, if, you know, uh, esoteric in that it doesn't really address teaching. It talks, uh, if, you, if you read uh, much of his work, he talks about um, in the professions. Uh, some of the examples he worked with are architects or social workers. So um, it's a little tricky to apply that to teaching, but it can be done. And so there are there are similar aspects of all of the orientations that kind of present some drawbacks. That's why uh, I suggest that in teacher education as well as in teaching practice, we should encourage and aim for um, reflective thinking in all of these orientations at different points in our career. Uh, the other thing is that many of these only consider what are you writing about. They really look at reflection uh, in a very singular way, with the exception of, of, of Schoen, of the reflection in and on action. Most of them consider reflection as a solitary act. Uh, they don't consider the communal aspect of reflection, and they typically consider it in a retrospective way, looking backwards on something I did, and it's typically done by writing in a journal. So the idea that there are other ways to think about reflection, how does this happen as a process, uh, suggests that we need another way to look at reflection. While these are important in terms of identifying the value and the truth and the meaning of reflection, it doesn't necessarily tell us how does it happen. So we need a second dimension. And so that's why I identified these, the second dimension of the components of reflection, which is another way of characterizing it. And this really looks at the experiences or the activities or the context and the tasks that we are involved in to get us, get us reflecting. And this comes from, uh, as it says there, three different, uh, three different pieces of literature that kind of influence the construction of this particular dimension. And as you can see, we've seen this graphic before, kind of these four basic questions. What starts you reflecting? What is causing you to reflect? What I call the stimulus for reflection. What are you thinking about? What are you reflecting about? The content of reflection. What questions are you prompted with? What ideas are you considering? How are you reflecting? What is the process of reflection? Uh, are you doing this by yourself? Are you doing it with someone else? Is it in writing? Is it is it oral? Is it technological? There are many different processes that you can follow for development of reflective practice. And then finally, why are you doing it? What is your purpose? What is the outcome of reflection? And so the idea of stimulus um, frequently is considered as a, as a problem that you need to solve or a puzzle. Um, but the context in which that, that stimulus occurs is very important. It could be something like a field experience. It could be a research experience. It could be an engagement with um, new ideas from uh, research literature, such as we're approaching in this particular course when we, when we get into the readings on multiculturalism. Uh, that will certainly prompt many of you to think differently about what you do. It could be a teaching experience that you've had. So there's lots of different ways that we can get started uh, on this process of reflection. <coughs> Pardon me. The content of reflection is really what is it you're thinking about? What is it you're talking about? And Zeichner and Liston, who are two very influential scholars on uh, 
on teacher education and on reflection, broke it down into kind of five different categories. And you might see there's a little bit of, of consistency between those and, and some of those other ideas we've talked about, about different orientations. But these are the kind of things that when people do research on students' development of reflection or teachers' reflective uh, thinking, they usually code it. They take, um, you know, some writing that you've done and they look for certain kinds of words or certain themes or certain ideas and say, oh, well, we found they started talking about, um, about the ELL students in their class and, and issues of access and equity. So that indicates they're starting to move up into this social reconstructionist kind of tradition or what I would call a critical orientation to reflection. The process of reflection. What do we do? How do we go about this? What is the system of action that we're going to follow as a process for making meaning of things? And, <clears throat> excuse me, so uh, as, as some people have said, you don't just say, okay, go reflect and write in your journals. But oftentimes that's all the explicit instruction that we ever get about it. And so once again, this is why we're taking three weeks uh, out of our semester here to get started by spending some time considering what different ways could I go about this. Should I do it by myself? Should I do something and then get other people's feedback on that? Um, how should I go about this? And finally, the outcome. So what is really the big idea? What's the big purpose of this? Um, is it a critical approach? Uh, do I want to improve my own uh, moral perspective and my moral lens on what I do as a person? Or is it simply, I want to be a better teacher kind of thing? So uh, we can look within a particular science education course and see how these different things might fall into play. So uh, we might see that, that we have students watch a video of a, of, a, of a, we'll say, an exemplary um, teaching episode, and we want them to reflect after that. And they reflect. What, I tell, what you might tell them to do is, Tell me about your own ideas about what you think makes up good science teaching and learning after having watched this video. Uh, respond in writing, as it says, that's the process. And finally, our purpose or our outcome of this is, as it says, recognition of the authority of experience. That means how does an experienced teacher, I want them to understand how an experienced teacher can think clearly about science teaching and learning. So typically, in the education literature, there were kind of two ways we looked at reflection. We had all this theory <coughs> from people like Van Manen that talked about what's the purpose and value for this. And then we had this very practical stuff that said, okay, here's what we do in our classes, and here's what they've written about. So what we need, and what I propose, is the confluence of these two things, these two uh, areas, that look at both why reflection is important and how it is put into use in teacher education and teacher professional development. So this heuristic, which was part of my article, and I've also posted that as a reading for this week that you can use uh, in constructing your group discussion board post and response, looks, breaks it down. Uh, so uh, the columns, the different columns, look at the uh, components of reflection with some examples of uh, the significant people that wrote about it, and then the rows across look at the different orientations. So it helps you see how the orientation, your orientation to reflection is really manifested by the things you do. So this heuristic looked at Valley's five orientations. I did a lot of reading from um, the significant scholarship about each orientation, and from that picked out the key phrases that kind of identified what was going on, and then I organized that into that two-dimensional matrix. So my research has involved looking at 
teacher educators, people like me, what are our orientations uh, to reflection and what are the components that we put into place into science education programs? Uh, what are the influences on those orientations? Where do they come from? The origins? What do we perceive are the constraints and limitations toward putting those into practice? And what kind of intentions do we have for specific components? And then finally, how do the components reveal what our orientations are? And so this heuristic, I suggest, is significant in that we can further extend and understand the different kinds of approaches that we have to reflection. Uh, we can examine curriculum. Uh, one of the things I did is I looked at this particular course curricula and said, you know, uh, are we satisfying, are we addressing the different components of reflection in this? Well, I think the outcome was pretty clear. You know, we wanted our, our MAT st uh, students to develop a critical perspective, but uh, it did not seem like the process was well articulated, um, and we really didn't consider different stimuli for reflection. And so that's what I'm going to try and involve you in as, uh, as I work through this program, too. So, that gives you a, a little, maybe, hopefully, better articulated understanding of how I think about reflection and how we're going to approach it in our experiences in this program. So thanks for your interest, and I will post this, uh, of course, on our community, and I hope you find it beneficial.